there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The great Canadian wilderness, where water and vegetation rule their domain. It's hard to imagine that in the past, the landscape looked more like this. Once upon a time, volcanoes had free reign over this land. Then how was nature able to create such abundance from a heap of smoking ash? That's the great story of life. While volcanoes in Canada are a treasure jealously kept hidden by nature, they are still responsible for some of the most enchanting landscapes. But these volcanic gems concealed with natural expanses are accessible only to the most adventurous. The Uncharted Canada team set out to discover the volcanoes of British Columbia. They're getting ready to embark on an almost 2,000 kilometer trek along the string of volcanoes that stretches across the province from north to south. Like Pinatubo in the Philippines, Krakatoa in Indonesia, and Mount St. Helens in the US, the volcanoes of BC are part of a gigantic belt of volcanoes circling the Pacific Ocean, known as the Ring of Fire. From the far south to the north of BC, the adventurers will embark on a trek that will take them through some of the most stunning volcanic sites. Starting from the Garibaldi Massif, they'll make a stop at Box Canyon, carved out of the lava. Discover Canada's most recent and deadliest lava flow, the Niska's Lava Field, and end up at the Aziza Volcano, a mountain sacred to the Taltan people. This is Mount Garibaldi. From the outside, it looks like any other mountain. But inside, it's quite another story. The mountain, like most of the surrounding summits, is actually nothing but a fragile cap perched over the boiling cauldron that is our planet's core. We are 70 kilometers north of Vancouver, at the end of a chain of volcanoes extending from California to Canada, the Cascade Volcanic Arc. Any of these volcanoes could erupt at any moment. With a surrounding population of over 10 million people, it's one of the most dangerous volcanic chains in the world. Mount Garibaldi and its neighbors are no exception. Our adventurers, Damien and Francois Xavier, begin their trek here on Black Tusk, a pinnacle in Garibaldi Provincial Park. The problem is, if one rock falls, I fall with it. Okay, Glenn, you can go. Okay, careful the rock. Yeah. It's really crumbly. Whoa. What better introduction to our adventure than climbing the most famous peak in the area, which is, on top of it all, a classic example of a volcano. Climbing up towards me is volcanologist Glenn William Jones, who will accompany us throughout the adventure. At the summit, we'll meet up with Damien, who is in a plane rather than on foot. He'll be kind of like our eye in the sky as we explore this landscape. As we head north during our exploration of volcanism, we'll travel not only through space, but also through time, as we turn back the geological clock to the birth of our planet, but also to the origin of life. You okay? Oh yeah. We're almost there, huh? Oh. 
cool. Congrats. Excellent. Quite the view, huh? Oh, that's incredible. We can totally see everything. It really was worth it. Look at the color of the lake. Fix, do you read me? Damien, I read you loud and clear, and I can even hear the sound of your engine. I'm heading your way. What side of the Black Task are you on? The south side. I'll try to find you. It's amazing. The color of the lake is gorgeous today. I think Lynn and I are a little jealous. Absolutely. Well, you interview way more than I did. It's incredible. It's like the landscape was painted in black and white. It's a mix of uh, ice and rock. Yes, and, and that's characteristic of this part of the world. It's glacier volcanism, and we're known for that in, in British Columbia. So there was an intrusion of, of magma, of molten rock uh, beneath the ice. Basically, everything we see here dates to around the end of the last ice age, about 10 to 12,000 years ago. There used to be much more ice here. Yes, I mean, 12 to 13,000 years ago, you can see maybe two to 300 meters of ice above our head. Right here? Yeah, above our heads. Okay, so Mount Garibaldi was almost entirely covered in ice. Yes, the ice would have been, you know, at the level of the summits here. At summit level. So all the mountains we see here are volcanoes. Yeah, exactly. That were formed under the ice. Most of them. So the lava comes out of the Earth's core? From the crust. And it meets the ice that melts instantly, I imagine. It melts instantly uh, in a super energetic, explosive reaction. And what's really interesting, if you look at Mount Garibaldi, it's a young volcano. It's probably just 250,000 years old. Okay. That, but that formed under the ice. But a lot of it passed through the ice, and the ash and lava built up a large part of the structure that we uh, see above the ice. Above the ice? Yes. So when the ice disappeared at the end of the ice age, the volcano had no more foundation and collapsed? Yes, and you know, with gravity and time, all this will fall to pieces. Do you read me, Fix? Loud and clear, Damien. He's just to the left of the mountain, right across the glacier. Beautiful. I'll head straight to the mountain. Wow. Wow, that's just incredible. The Black Tusk is very well named. It's a real rock spur. I'm passing over Table Mountain. It's a strangely shaped mountain with a flat top. The strangely shaped mountain Damien mentioned, just like Black Tusk, is a real specialty of Canadian volcanology. They are what are called tuyas. Once again, these shapes are a result of the titanic battle between ice and lava. As it rose to the surface, the lava melted a passage in the ice that was then solidified by the cold. It was only at the end of the last ice age, around 10,000 years ago, that these otherworldly shaped peaks became exposed. I have to say these geological scales are hard for lay people to wrap their heads around. You say two million years or two billion years? Yeah, uh, that's normal. Uh, humans are, are recent and, and we don't live very long. But the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. Yeah. We're, we're a blip in geologic history. Uh -huh. But if you like, you know, we could draw a scale. So you know, why not start here? This will be 4.6 billion years right here. Yeah. So you go over to that mount. You'll be the modern age. The present. The present, exactly. Works for me. I like this game. My jacket will be 4.6 billion years ago. The origin of the Earth? The origin of the Earth. The next one will be our, our ancestors. 1.5 billion years ago. So you just skipped over a period of 3 billion years. Yeah, this is our first ancestor. A small bacteria in the ocean. Okay. Now we'll see something that everyone has heard about. Oh, you're getting really close. 65 million years ago was the end of the dinosaurs. Wow, okay. So right here, it's the arrival of modern humans. So to make this easier to, to grasp, 
make the scale in 24 hours. Modern humans arrive at about four seconds before midnight. Wow, okay, we're pretty recent. Yeah, incredible. And pretty insignificant. Absolutely. The dizzying immensity of geological time reduces humans to but a footnote in history. But shockingly, the volcanoes here aren't much older. The first North Americans colonized this land around 10,000 BC. So it's not that fanciful to imagine that humans could have had a front row seat when some of these rocky behemoths were formed. To understand the volcanoes of BC, we need to look to the sea. The Pacific Ocean is circled by a giant ring of volcanoes that constantly rattle the planet with earthquakes and volcanic eruptions from the Philippines to Chile, from Kamchatka to British Columbia. It's called the Ring of Fire. At the origin of this constant volcanic activity is the Oceanic Ridge. This is where the oceanic crust is formed Magma rising from the Earth's core creates convection cycles that pull apart the oceanic plates at a rate of four centimeters per year. It's through this process that the continent moves. It's what's called plate tectonics. When the oceanic plate meets the continent, it dips down toward the Earth's core. As it travels downward, the rock melts, rises again to the surface, loaded with gas, pierces the continental crust, and causes an eruption. Off Vancouver Island on the west coast of BC, this is the Juan de Fuca Ridge. It's responsible for the volcanism of a large part of the west coast. At a depth of close to 2,500 meters, it's one of the most inaccessible places on the planet. This ship, run by the Oceanic Research Institute, Ocean Networks Canada, is headed for the Juan de Fuca Ridge. In 2007, at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, the Institute set up the largest underwater ocean observation network in the world, the Neptune Network. With a fiber optic cable stretching over 800 kilometers, the Neptune Network is strategically located under the Juan de Fuca tectonic plate. Through instruments and sensors connected to the entire length of the network, scientists can observe the oceanic processes like never before. We're like an astronomical telescope, a large facility used to observe the ocean and its physical, geological, and biological processes. We provide data from the entire network to scientists at universities throughout the world. This summer, we're getting ready to expand the network to the Endeavour Ridge. Since all the maintenance work on the network is done at extremely great depths, we need a robotic, remote-controlled submarine that works 24-7. At nightfall, they reach the Juan de Fuca Ridge. 2.5 kilometers below the ship extends the volcanic site known as the Endeavour Hydrothermal Vents. It's the place farthest away from their network of instruments and also the hardest to access. A long night's work begins for the Ocean Network's team. As the remote-controlled submarine heads toward the abyss of the underwater volcanic site, the Ocean Network's team observes a moving pageant a series of creatures from the commonest species to the strangest life forms appear before their camera like an open book of evolution. Extreme ocean depths remain to this day a profound mystery to scientists. Strangely enough, we seem to know more about outer space than the ocean depths, but it is possible to see a certain resemblance. At 
last, the submarine reaches the bottom. Before it, in the inky blackness of the ocean depths, the famous Endeavour hydrothermal vents come into view. Nowhere else in Canada can we feel closer to the Earth's core. Like surface volcanoes, the volcanic vents spit out burning hot clouds of smoke that raise the water temperature here to over 300 degrees Celsius. In such extreme conditions, it's easy to think that no life could emerge. But it's quite the opposite. Some suspect that life on Earth actually began here. The submarine robot of the Ocean Network's Canada Research Institute has reached the Endeavour hydrothermal vents on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. The big job of repairing and extending the Institute's research facilities starts at a depth of 2,500 meters. Uh, Keith has one junction box out here with an extension cable back to uh, RCM North. Hydrothermal vents form when two oceanic plates separate from one another, which is the case at the Endeavour site, and magma rises to the surface. Buckling under the colossal pressure, the crust forms cracks, allowing water to leak down toward the mantle. Pushed by the high temperature and pressure, the water rises again to the surface, dissolving the surrounding minerals and rock, and, as with a volcanic eruption, projects debris into the ocean. As they cool down, the minerals precipitate and form vents. But the story doesn't end here, because as soon as the vents form, life emerges immediately. It was a big surprise for researchers to discover that there could be ecosystems on Earth that were completely independent of the sun and photosynthesis. That completely changed our ideas about life on other planets, in our solar system, and elsewhere in the universe. It seems like a hostile environment where life is impossible, but it's a high energy environment in a food desert. There's no food at 2,000 meters. It's very far from the surface, and there's very little to eat. The solution that life found to the total absence of light and therefore photosynthesis around the hydrothermal vents is called chemosynthesis. With no access to solar energy, organisms use the chemical energy given off by the volcanic vents to transform CO2 to organic matter, just like with photosynthesis. And that's what forms the basis of the food chain at the hot springs. Bacteria transform chemical energy into matter, into biomass, and the fauna there either eats bacteria directly or lives with it in symbiosis. There's a large abundance of worms that lack a mouth and a digestive system. They live entirely from the bacteria that live in symbiosis inside their bodies. These worms of the depths absorb dissolved gases, such as H2S, CO2, and oxygen, using the red gills that adorn their upper bodies. The molecules penetrate into their circulatory system and are brought to the bacteria, which carry out the chemosynthesis reaction that feeds the worms. It's a wonderful example of what we call symbiosis, a collaboration between two species to adapt to their environment and allow for their survival. Some researchers suggest that life on Earth actually began around thermal springs hundreds of millions of years ago. At that time, the surface of the Earth was quite hostile. It had no ozone layer, there were UV rays, it was bombarded by rubble from comets, and so on. But underwater, in the oceans, the environment was far more stable and there was constant energy coming from the thermal springs. The springs acted as a kind of bioreactor, 
So, when the first molecules of life formed, they were allowed to recirculate in the environment. And this increased the possibility of meeting other molecules. And that's exactly what had to happen to form the first cells. These cells, once formed, then stayed in the environment to absorb minerals. While volcanoes are mountains forged by fire, they often meet their end through water. In a volcano's young, shifting soil, the slightest stream can create dizzying voids. foot of the Garibaldi volcano, waters carved out of the layers of lava, a rocky cirque 70 meters high. Volcanoes are hastily built mountains and much more fragile than they look. Subjected to the laws of erosion, they don't resist the passage of time for long. One of the most striking examples of erosion can be found at a place those in the know call Box Canyon. Watch out. You have to go easy here. It's incredible. As you move forward into the canyon, you really feel like you're going into the heart of the mountain. And the further we go, the more the jaws of rock close in over our heads. The amazing thing is that there are two completely different types of rock. The soil to our left and granite to our right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the origins are actually really quite similar. They're, these rocks form by magma, but you know, in the case of granite, the rock remained underground, whereas the basalt, it rose out of the ground onto the surface beneath our atmosphere. So that's a big difference between basalt and granite. On one side we have lava that float from a volcano and cooled off by contact with the air, while the granite here is also magma, but it rose up and stayed underground where it cooled off. And it was probably, you know, tens of kilometers underground. How old is a rock like this? This one here is about 100 million years old. And that rock there? And that one over there, about 10,000 to maybe 30,000 years old. Which is the same age as Mount Garibaldi. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a clear difference here between the look of these two rocks. Yeah, and the granite is, is really resistant. The, the minerals are, are extremely hard. Whereas if we look at the lava, the basalt, it's full of fractures, it breaks into chunks very easily. So you, you can just, you can see all those joints. So, all the rock missing from up there is under our feet. Yeah, underneath our feet. And that's why we're wearing helmets. That's why we should move along. <laughs> that's a good idea. Watch that rock. This is where we enter Box Canyon. We'll rappel down with a rope and Fix will be there to greet you in the pool. Spread your legs and lean backwards. We'll go bit by bit. It'll be fun. Okay. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. All right then. Earlier we were saying that it felt like going down to the center of the earth, but this time it's real. Have you looked below? No, not yet. Yeah, we'll see. You'll see it soon. If you were here, you'd see. It's pretty impressive. Okay, here we go.
good. dense vegetation. Box Canyon was discovered by canyoneers barely two years ago. Only a handful of adventurers can harness its secrets and its dangers. Anyone who enters Box Canyon is fully committed since the only way out is to follow it downwards. Damien, Francois Xavier, and their guest, volcanologist Glenn Williams-Jones, have entered the canyon carved into the granite known as Box Canyon, only a few kilometers from the Garibaldi volcano. This is excellent. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. It's extremely impressive entering Box Canyon. The water flowing through that crack in the rock at an incredible speed, with incredible power. The air rumbles from the power of the waterfall. You really feel in the canyon at that point, at the center of the earth. You know, going in for the first time, I thought, <laughs> Am I really going to be able to do this? I didn't have much rock climbing experience to speak of, and, you know, seeing that, that torrent of water, I wasn't sure it was going to end well. There is no way to turn around once you're committed. You have to follow the waterway to the end, to the exit. And getting hurt in a canyon like this could have major consequences. You really feel alone in the world in this place, and no one will come looking for you. You are more suspended in time, cut off from the world, and surrounded by these walls of granite and basalt. It's really beautiful. The erosion there is just incredible. And you can see how it varies from one year to the next, you know, over tens of thousands of years. It was incredible, you know, seeing the power of the water and the power of the erosion that, that cut through that granite. It really is something primordial. On an intellectual level, you can say, yeah, I can see the power of erosion, but it wasn't the same being in it, having that torrent in my face. I, I felt it in my bones the constant impact of the water. And I'm not made of rock. The further you go into the canyon, the more you really feel like you're underground. It's extremely narrow and extremely deep. No light gets in and the walls are perfectly smooth. Not even moss can grow here at the bottom. Right when you really feel like you've reached the center of the mountain, there's a tube maybe a meter in diameter, really narrow, with a waterfall flowing through it. And at the end of the tube, around 20 meters deep, you see light. Then you think, okay, if I can get through the tube, I'll get out of the canyon. There's a very meditative aspect to it. You go into the center of the earth, you cut off from the world. You don't even know really what time it is. And when you come back out, you feel like you're reborn, like you've come back into the world. You can see the green of the trees, hear the sounds and bird calls. You know, it's all well and good to, to look at things in a book from an intellectual perspective. 
But it's when you feel it and you live it, that experience that really makes things fascinating. While the lava that partly makes up this canyon flowed barely 10,000 years ago, a blip on the geological time scale, some volcanic events in Canada are much more recent, so recent that people remember them. But humans and volcanoes can be a very bad combination. Located on the Nass River in central western BC, the village of Gitwink Silk is as peaceful as they come. Yet the community has a tragic history. It was founded by the survivors of the worst natural disaster in Canadian history. Around 300 years ago, the Tseeks volcano erupted 20 kilometers away from the Nass River. Lava flowed down the valley, burying two Nizga villages along the way. 2,000 people lost their lives. The survivors passed the story of the eruption down through generations. As a result, we can hear a detailed version of the account today directly from their descendants. The ground started to shake. It's like an earthquake. They thought it was an earthquake. And they could see smoke coming over the mountain behind them. They reported about a horrible fire monster. They called it Lachmich. Lachmich literally translates as to be on the flames or on the fire. They described this monster as having legs of fire. It had a body of mist and steam. When it came, uh, uh, it was moving too fast for them to run away. It got covered by the lava. Other people running away from the lava were burnt by the fires. Those who came on this side of that lake uh, with the lava, it pushed the, ri the river in front of it. And so a wall of water coming this way. So the those of members of our family did so by climbing on this mountainside, going above where the water was pushing. And they, they say the river was fighting the fire. They could see these two monsters fighting each other for who's gonna get to go by. The Niska lava fields are a burial site a natural monument to the memory of the dead. Many questions remain about the way the events unfolded, and studying the imprints left by the solidified lava can help us learn more. Glenn and his research team went to the source of the lava, the Tseeks volcano. Through observations in the field, they hope to lift the veil on some historical uncertainties. We're on the site of one of the most recent volcanic eruptions in Canada, around 250 to 300 years ago. We don't know exactly when. The Niska oral history talks in detail about the, the lava flow. They talk about the fact that it could have killed upwards of 2,000 people. However, there's also some limited evidence uh, from some Spanish sailors who may have been on the Nass River at the same time who mentioned seeing a wall of fire. So one theory to explain these observations, uh, as well as the speed at which the people may have been killed, is that you know, there could have been a forest fire triggered by the lava flow. You can really see the difference here. These small gas bubbles versus the big ones, you know, around the edges. They're lighter, you know, the other one's much denser. Normally, lava flows are slow moving. You can walk faster than most lava flows. So by carrying out our studies, we're going to try to understand the properties of the rock. Can we try to create models that will tell us, you know, was this a really fast flowing lava flow? Or was it the flow that triggered a forest fire? You know, did we also have volcanic gases that came out uh, and that was responsible for killing the people? Ah, look at that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. oh that's fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Les bulles de gaz ont 
So the gas bubbles, they swelled and merged uh, to give us these, these little things that, that look almost like wasps' nests or something, something organic. Now, it means that the lava was very, very liquid and very rich in gas and that ejected these drops of lava. So the goal here is to try to understand what happened when the volcano erupted. We do this by looking at the surroundings and also by trying to map the area. The lava flowed down the valley, turned 90 degrees towards the Nass Valley, and then 90 degrees again, farther down. But we don't really know how the various episodes of the flow occurred. And this is when the 3D model that we're trying to make comes in. It will help us better understand what happened. From up in the air, Francois Xavier and Damien take part in the research effort. Glenn asked them to put their plane to use for creating a model of the flow in three dimensions. We have a camera attached to the frame of our plane just to my left here that I'll be able to switch on when we begin our flyover. Glenn and his assistants uh, give us a very precise flight plan. We'll try to stay constantly at the same altitude above ground, which is 500 meters. We'll fly back and forth in a grid pattern above the lava flow. The idea is to take a lot of photos of the same object from different angles in order to deduce the third dimension. It's called photogrammetry. It's the same principle that we used to use to derive altitude for topographical maps. Glenn and his team follow the trajectory of the flow and under the blazing sun, reach the lava fields. While sterile in appearance, this rocky desert of 180 square kilometers harbors a resilient flora that has adapted to this lunar landscape. But it will never replace the forest that formerly blanketed the banks of the Nass River. So this is basically the mold left by a tree that was knocked down in the lava flow. But uh, when you look inside, you can see a very distinctive texture. It is the actual tree catching fire, burning, and the burning is hot enough to remelt the lava, and the lava invades this charcoalized tree. If you burn a piece of lumber and then pour water on it, you'll be left with this, um, this charcoal pattern. Even though they're really far from the source, we see almost no crystals in the rock. So this means that the lava was completely liquid right before it cooled. And with samples like that we see here, it, it's really possible that in fact the lava flow started very quickly and therefore was responsible for killing the people. As the sun sets over the valley, Francois Xavier and Damien join Glenn and his team to observe the 3D model created using the aerial photos of the flow. So this is the model, huh? Beautiful. And it's, it's really thanks to the photos that you shot. It's incredible. There's so much detail. So you found that the speed of the lava is actually what could have been fatal to the Nishka? Yes. You know, as soon as it entered the valley, uh, it made a 90-degree turn and continued at high speed. So one of your major discoveries of this research season is that the lava flow was probably very fast moving? Yes, and these initial observations with, by the NISCA were correct. It's pretty incredible being able to make a correlation between science and folklore. Yes. Oral history is data that we can use. The only difference is the way the data was recorded. It's not written down, it's handed down orally, but it's still good fundamental data. Damien and Francois Xavier have helped elucidate part of the mystery. Several questions obviously remain, and most of them will be left unanswered, buried under the Niska lava fields.
Earth, water, air, and fire. Four elements that make up our planet. So complex, so multifaceted, and so fertile. They say there is beauty in simplicity. It seems that some places have used these four elements as a painter would, soberly and with restraint. Landscapes of infinite simplicity, like a return to the primordial earth before humans, before life. A land that seems completely untrammeled. So when humans set their footprints on the soil of the Aziza volcano, it's with the humility of those returning to their origins. Wow, wow. we're getting some sun here. Yeah, it really brings out the colors, it's fantastic. But, you know, even without the sun, just the contrast between the colors of the rock, the, the contrasting red and white. There's even some purple over there. Yeah. And that deep orange there. Yeah, it's just vivid. Incredible. So, Glenn, to what do we owe the Zaiza Massif? Well, Zaiza is in the Spectrum Range, which is part of the northern Cordilleran volcanic province formed by plate tectonics. But instead of the type of tectonics we saw in Garibaldi, which was subduction, meaning a plate that slips under another plate. Yeah, exactly. Here it's a transverse fault, so the plates are moving side by side. So parallel. Yeah, horizontal, yes, parallel. And due to that movement, the continental crust is stretched like an elastic band. And when you stretch an elastic band, it gets thinner in the middle. The crust gets thinner. Yeah, the crust gets thinner. And so due to this thinning, magma can more easily form and rise or float to the, to the top. And that's really what's responsible for the formation of this huge volcanic province. So where we are, the crust is much thinner, right? And the magma could rise to the surface. Exactly. Where do these beautiful colors we see around us come from? The red, the purple and orange? Well, you know, this spectrum of colors, um, and thus the name spectrum range, is really just due to something pretty simple, rust. Just tiny amounts of iron in the rocks become corroded by the oxygen in the atmosphere. So as it's corroded by this interaction with the climate, it forms these incredible colors. We're talking thousands of years, I imagine. Yeah, thousands of years, absolutely. Well, sometimes nature does a great job, eh? Oh, yeah. It's so beautiful. You just need lots of patience. Yeah. You ready for a foot bath? Oh, yeah. I wonder about the temperature. It's going to be a bit chilly. It'll wake us up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cold. <laughs> It'll wake us up. Yeah. I feel like for every adventure we have to take our shoes off and cross a river. It's getting to be a habit. Anything for science. Anything for the science and exploration. It's a good chance to wash our feet. <laughs> exactly. It's fine. It's great. Yeah, stop playing the tough guy. I know you're suffering. Oh my god. <laughs> these, these kinds of scenes, we should film them in the Amazon or Costa Rica or something, you know, without the piranhas. In a speedo? <laughs> in a speedo. <sighs> this really hurts. Glenn, when I walk around a landscape like this, I feel like I've returned to the origin of the planet. Yeah, exactly. You know, we can imagine being on the Earth's surface billions of years ago. Yeah. A surface that was covered in active volcanoes, spewing columns of gas and ash. Seriously, some incredibly hostile conditions. But these volcanoes are in part the reason we eventually got the atmosphere we have now. It was obviously super toxic at the time. Yeah, at the time there was ammonia. Yes, CO2, acid gases, sulfur. 
But one of the most common gases in volcanoes is actually water vapor. And over time, that gave rise to the atmosphere we have now, as well as all of the oceans. And in these primary oceans were the conditions favorable for the eventual development of primordial life. Could fire have possibly given rise to life? The irony is almost too perfect. Buried in a layer of clouds, the majestic Mount Ziza, sacred to the Taltan people, seems quite indifferent to the life it towers over. Yet everywhere on its slopes, ravaged by successive eruptions, there is a kind of infinitely austere beauty. Far too inaccessible for the uncharted Canada team, Mount Ziza was left to its cloudy isolation. On their trek around the mountain, the adventurers cross plains so fertile they seem straight out of the Serengeti in Africa. They wear down the soles of their shoes on lava fields as sharp as glass before reaching the final step in their journey, the majestic Eve Cone, a biblical name that oddly enough refers once again to our most primordial origins. And there's Eve Cone in all its splendor. One of the smallest cones in Canada, but also one of the most beautifully shaped. Huh? It's beautiful. And it's so beautifully shaped, you can see that it's all black at the top. So there's really not very much lichen yet, which means it's really quite young. Really young, huh? Yes. You know, around 1300 years ago, imagine a fountain of lava spewing into the air, jets going up tens to even hundreds of meters high. All this material gradually falls back down to form this cone. You know, it's, it's like a Coke bottle. You just shake up that bottle and you'll see the froth starting to form. Well, that's the volcanic gas under pressure. The cap then flies off and you get this massive explosive eruption. So the explosive eruptions are due to gases contained in the lava? Yes, absolutely. These gases expanding are the energy that propels everything upwards. We can see traces of lava. Is there a way to see gas remnants? Yes, actually, you know, in the lava there will be remnants. If you take a piece and you break it open... So you can see all these different bubble sizes. Flattened bubbles too. Yes, because the lava was moving. So it stretched the vesicles, the, the bubbles that are in the lava. And there aren't any crystals. We've just seen volcanic glass. That's volcanic glass. Yeah. That trapped the gas. That makes it very light, right? Yeah, it makes it much lighter. Glenn, you told us about the Earth's first billions of years. What happens next? You've got to really imagine the, the advent of the earliest life, which started, we believe, in an incredibly hostile environment, around vents on the ocean floor. Kilometers deep, you know, these little miniature volcanoes. And then we gradually see the emergence of cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae, which was the beginning of photosynthesis on our planet. My friends, you're going to love the view. Yes, fantastic. Yeah, quite the view. It's huge. And there's the crater. Yeah. It's gigantic, a mouth open to the sky. And the crater is right in front of us? Yeah. And what was ejected is behind us. And all the lava flows? Incredible. Yeah. Should we take a walk? Yeah, towards Adziza. All right, let's go. So, were blue-green algae the precursors of the plant kingdom? Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, what did the blue-green algae do? They removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and as a waste, injected that oxygen into the atmosphere. So gradually, the atmosphere starts to really change. 
So afterwards, plants start to spread all across the planet. And through photosynthesis, they continue changing and modifying the atmosphere by adding more and more oxygen. It's, it's really only afterwards that we see the arrival of animals. The animal kingdom follows the plant kingdom. Yes. You know, the first fish dared to crawl onto land and adapt to an atmosphere that was now rich in oxygen. So over time, all life that we see on our planet gradually started to evolve and change. So the beginning of a great chain of life. Exactly. And at the end of the chain is us humans. Us humans. I think that's the perfect conclusion to this amazing adventure. Such a beautiful journey. Exactly. From volcanoes to humans. Amazing. And with the most beautiful view there is. Absolutely. The Eve Gone Crater. Well, guys, it was a pleasure to go on this adventure with you. It was awesome. Amazing. Really awesome. Yeah.